Let's open our Bibles together to 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. 2 Timothy 2.25 for our message from the Word of God this morning. Page 1280 in the Pew Bibles. Today's date is August 27th, 2017. Today's text is in 2 Timothy 2, verses 25 and 26. The last two verses of the chapter. And the title of this morning's message is Teaching Others in Meekness. Teaching Others in Meekness. And we begin with the story of a little boy in school who was sitting with his head laid down on his desk. So his teacher said to him, Johnny, you can't sleep in my class. To which Johnny replied, I know. But maybe I could if you'd just keep it down a little bit. <laughs> and then he added, I don't mean to scare you, but my dad says that unless my grades improve, somebody's going to get a spanking. <laughs> well, you may not consider yourself to be a teacher this morning, but if you want to be a servant of the Lord, that's what you're going to have to be. At least that's what the Apostle Paul says in our text in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 25. Let's begin in verse 24 to get the context. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, to begin with, Paul is speaking here, of course, to a pastor. And he's telling Pastor Timothy that he must be a teacher an instructor. But if you want to be a servant of the Lord, you too are going to have to be an instructor and learn how to teach somebody that Paul calls those that oppose themselves. <laughs> well, well, who are they? Well, that phrase is only used a few times in the Bible. And since the law of first mention says the first time a word or a phrase appears in the Bible, it kind of defines it. Let's look at the first time this phrase appears in your first cross-reference in Job 30 and verse 21. Job is praying here, and he says to God, Thou art become cruel to me. With thy strong hand thou opposest thyself against me. Now, what's that all about? Well, first of all, you'll notice that Job says that God Himself was the first one in the Bible to oppose Himself. And as you may know, Job, Job was a righteous man. 
And one day God pointed this out to Satan in your next reference. Look at Job 1 and verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? Now that word perfect can have different meanings depending on the context, so the context goes on to explain what God meant. When he said that Job was a perfect and an upright man, he said he's one that feareth, feareth God and escheweth evil. Now, do you remember how Satan replied to this report from God? Look at your next reference in Job 1, verses 9 and 10. Then Satan answered, Doth Job fear God for naught, for nothing? Hast, thou, hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Satan argued that the reason Job was good was because God had blessed him so much. How much had God blessed him? Well, in your next reference, speaking of Job, it says his substance was the greatest of all the men of the East. He was the richest guy in the East, folks. And God had made a protective hedge around him so that nothing could happen to him or to his house because of his righteousness. Now, we need to point out something here. That is not what God is doing in the dispensation of grace, is it? No matter what you hear from the health and wealth preachers. <laughs> but it was what God was doing to other men back then. We know that because there were other godly men who were alive at that time who God was treating the same way. You see, Job lived not long after Abraham and Lot. And in your next reference, what do we read about Abraham and Lot? Abraham and Lot had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. They had so many flocks and so many herds, there just wasn't enough grazing land to support both of them. So, Job wasn't the only one that God prospered in those days in response to their righteousness. But if you know the story of Job, you know God took away his protective hedge and allowed him to be afflicted with sore boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And he allowed his house to be afflicted. He allowed all of his kids to die. And he took away all of his substance, all of his wealth. And when he did that, folks, Job said he was opposing himself. He wasn't acting like the God he had been in the past. So that gives us a feeling for what that means, that business of those that oppose themselves. Now, here's the thing about that, though, we need to point out. When God ceased blessing Job because of his righteousness, he didn't do anything wrong. God was under no obligation to reward Job's righteousness. You see, he'd never promised that he would reward righteous men with good things like that. 
He later promised that to the Jews under the law, didn't he? Look at your next reference. Deuteronomy 7, 12 to 15, he said, If you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, he will bless the fruit of thy land, thy corn, the flocks of thy sheep, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. He'll make you healthy and he'll make you wealthy. That's what he told the people of Israel. So, if God took their protective hedge away and, and failed to prosper them when they were good, the people of Israel could have charged Him with unrighteousness for breaking His promise. But, until He made that promise, all that Job could charge God with was opposing Himself with not being the kind of God he'd been in the past. Now, let me show you another verse that talks about people opposing themselves to give you some more feeling for what that means. The only other time in your Bible where it talks about people opposing themselves is in your next reference, in Acts 18, 1-6. Paul came to Corinth, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. And when they opposed themselves, those Jews in the synagogue, he shook his raiment and said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean from henceforth. I will go to the Gentiles. Now, what did Paul mean when he said those Jews opposed themselves? Well, let's go back to the first time that Paul said he was going to turn to the Gentiles in your next reference, Acts 13, 45 to 47. The Jews spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you Jews. But seeing ye have put it from you, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Well, as you can see there, Paul is quoting Isaiah 49, where we had our scripture reading this morning, isn't he? In that passage, God told Israel that he had set them to be a light to the Gentiles in the earth so that the Gentiles could hear the message of salvation. But remember, when we read that passage, we saw that God had worded it in such a way that you couldn't tell if He was setting Israel to be a light to the Gentiles or if He was setting Christ to be a light to the Gentiles. And that's because, folks, that's the only way Israel could be the light that God wanted them to be if they accepted Christ. Listen, they were just like us. They had no light of their own to shine to the Gentiles. The only way the Jews could shine to the Gentiles was to receive Christ and let Him shine through them. But that means when the Jews rejected Christ, Paul could say, well, if you don't want to let Christ shine through you, I'm going to take Christ and let Him shine directly to the Gentiles. And I say all that to say this. 
That means when it says the Jews opposed themselves in Acts 18, it means they opposed who God wanted them to be. God wanted them to be His light to the Gentiles. So when it says they opposed themselves, it means they were being the light that God made them to be. And folks, this is what it means when it says that Christians oppose themselves. God has made us saints. He sees us as perfect in Christ. And you know what? When we live in sin, we're opposing ourselves. We're not being the holy people that God made us to be. And when that happens, we can't do what it says in your next reference in Philippians 2.15. We can't be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. When you live in sin, you're not shining as a light for Christ. You're just reflecting the darkness that's all around you, aren't you? And when that happens, you're opposing yourself. You're not being the light that God made you. But there's more involved in being a light for Christ than just not living in sin. Beloved, a lot of unbelievers don't live in sin. And they're not shining the light of Christ to anybody. If you want to be the light to the world that God wants you to be, you also have to keep from teaching things like Hymenaeus and Philetus were teaching in your Bible now, back up in verse 18. After speaking of Hymenaeus and Philetus in verse 17, Paul says, "...who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some." If you're teaching things like that, if you're teaching things that are doctrinally incorrect, you're opposing yourself. You see, God made you to be a light, but a light of truth. And you can't be a light of truth if you're teaching error. And if you're opposing yourself and you're not being the light of truth that God wants you to be, well, according to our text here, what you need is for someone to come along and meekly instruct you to repent and acknowledge the truth, it says in verse 25. And that's what God has called on all of us to do, folks. All of us teachers. All of us instructors. Now, when it says that we have to in meekness instruct those that oppose themselves, maybe you're not sure what that word meekness means. So, let's apply the law of first mention again and look at your next reference where the first time the word meek is used in Numbers 12, verses 1 to 3. Remember when Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because he had married an Ethiopian woman. And then in parentheses it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Now, as you can see, Moses' brother and his sister didn't care for his choice in women, did he? Did they? But, if you know that passage, you know that Moses did absolutely nothing about it. And folks, that 
That is the epitome of meekness. You go after most men about their personal lives and you're going to have a fight on your hands. But God says you have to handle attacks like that, personal attacks like that, meekly. And Paul says that's how you have to instruct those who oppose themselves, meekly. Because if you ever tried to help someone who's living in sin, you know what you always hear. Well, who are you to tell me what I should or shouldn't do? I know you and you're no better than me. <laughs> you know, they get personal. And when they do, you have to react meekly. And just admit, you know, you're right. I'm not perfect. I do have faults of my own. Of course, if you don't have a lot of faults, if you are pretty close to perfect, you still want to instruct other people meekly because of what Paul says in your next reference in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. How? In the spirit of meekness. Why? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Hey folks, you might be the most moral, upright Christian on the planet. But that could change in a heartbeat. What Paul say? Let him that thinketh that he standeth do what? Take heed lest he fall. So, you want to be meek when you teach other people that living in sin is not who God made them to be in Christ. And when you try to instruct someone who's teaching error, they also tend to get personal and, and lash out at you. Who are you to correct my doctrine? You don't know the Bible any better than I do, so your interpretation is no better than mine. You know, they get personal. And when that happens, Paul says you have to be willing to instruct them meekly without reacting to their personal attack on you. And if you do, God says peradventure He'll give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, that word... Peradventure, that's not a word we use very much, but it's just a word that means perhaps. Uh, let me show you an example that I know you know in Romans 5, 7, and 8. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, there's our word, peradventure, perhaps, for a good man. Some would even dare to die, but... God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the word peradventure just means perhaps. So in our text, Paul is saying, if you can instruct other believers meekly, perhaps God will give them repentance. Now, here we have to be really careful as we figure out what it means when it says that God will perhaps give repentance to those who oppose themselves. Because it sounds like it's saying if we instruct other people, God might give them repentance. But then again, He might not. <laughs> but listen. That is never what the Bible means when it talks about giving men repentance. 
Look at your next reference in Acts chapter 5 and verse 30 and 31. God raised up Jesus, and Him hath God exalted with His right hand to do what? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, you know what it means when it says God gave repentance to Israel. It didn't mean that everybody in Israel repented and got forgiveness, did it? It meant that when Christ meekly instructed the people of Israel about their need to repent and be forgiven, He gave them the opportunity to repent and be forgiven. Perhaps they would. Perhaps they wouldn't. It was up to them. Now the ones who did could say, well, God gave me repentance. Because they, they couldn't have repented if He hadn't given them that opportunity, right? And here's the important part. The ones who didn't repent and weren't forgiven, they couldn't say it, wasn't be, it was because God didn't give them repentance. Because He gave them the same opportunity to repent as He gave the other ones. But you'll notice in that reference that it was an opportunity that God only gave to who? To the people of Israel. It was an opportunity that He didn't give the Gentiles until later when God sent Paul to the Gentiles, right? But you know what happened when He did. A lot of people didn't believe that Paul was an apostle. They didn't believe he, that God had sent him to the Gentiles. And you know what God did about that. He sent Peter to a Gentile or two so that he could establish Paul's ministry. And when he sent Peter to the Gentiles, look what men said about that in Acts 11 and verse 18, your next reference. They glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now the Gentiles had the opportunity to repent and be forgiven. Perhaps they would. Perhaps they wouldn't. It was up to them. When they did, they could say, God gave us repentance. Because it was an opportunity that God didn't give them at Pentecost. Didn't give them up until that time. And that's what Paul means here when he says God peradventure might give repentance to those who oppose themselves. If you meekly instruct those who oppose themselves, God gives them the opportunity to repent. Perhaps they will. Perhaps they won't. But it's up to them. The only peradventure thing about it is whether or not they decide to take the opportunity that God is giving them to repent and to do what the rest of verse 25 says. Acknowledge the truth that you're trying to instruct them in. And listen, the particular truth that you need to acknowledge if you're living in sin and opposing yourself that way is the truth that Paul spoke of to Philemon in Philemon 1.6. He talked about the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. If you're opposing yourself by living in sin, folks, the way to overcome sin in your life is not by beating yourself up with the law of Moses. The way to overcome sin in your life is to acknowledge all the good things that God has given you in Christ.
So that the love of Christ can constrain you to, to stop living in sin out of gratitude for saving you and blessing you with all those spiritual blessings and, and putting all those good things within you. And here, when you talk about overcoming this error that you might be teaching, maybe you're opposing yourself by teaching doctrinal error. There's a truth that you need to acknowledge in Titus 1 verse 1. Paul talks about the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. That's Paul's gospel, folks. Paul's gospel in this dispensation is the one that teaches you how to be godly. If what you're teaching doesn't lead to godliness, it is not truth for this dispensation. For instance, if you're like Philetus and Hymenius who teach that the resurrection is past and we all miss the, re the, 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 the blessed hope of the rapture, do you know how men act when they don't have a hope? Look at your next reference, Jeremiah 18.12. They said, there is no hope. But we will walk after our own devices and we will do everyone the imagination of his evil heart. If people don't have hope, they live in ungodliness. What did Paul say? That, uh, what did Paul say to do if our people do if there's no resurrection in your next reference? 1 Corinthians 15.32 If the dead rise not, then what? Well, let's just eat and drink and be merry, as they say, for tomorrow we die. If you're teaching false doctrine like that, it leads to ungodliness. It's not a truth according to godliness. It's not Paul's gospel. So the way to stop teaching incorrect doctrine is to acknowledge the truth that's after godliness. Acknowledge Paul's gospel. And that it's the gospel for this age. Now as we read on, we see that the reason those who oppose themselves uh, should repent is in verse 26. Back in your Bible now, in your text. The reason that God will peradventure give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth is so that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's a scary sounding verse. So let's talk about what it means. Now you know what the word recover means, right? You lose something or something is taken from you and you, you get it back. You're able to recover it. Um, when the Amalekites attacked David's village and, and sacked it, took away all their substance, they messed with the wrong ombre, didn't they? <laughs> Look at your next reference in 1 Samuel 30, verse 18. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. In other words, he got everything back that they took from him. And when it comes to recovering yourself out of the snare of the devil, that means Paul's talking about getting yourself back. Back to being the sinless person God sees you to be. You start opposing yourself by living in sin, God says you can recover yourself and get back to being the person God sees you to be. Teaching the truth that He's given you to teach. And the thing that those that oppose themselves need to recover themselves from is something that Paul calls the snare of the devil. Now what's that? Well, you probably know a snare is a trap, right? Look at Job 18.10. The, the snare is laid for him in the ground and a trap for him in the way. You see how that verse kind of defines a snare as a trap? 
And a snare trap, I've told you before, a, a snare trap is a, is a rope loop, or in these days they use wire, a loop, and they attach it to the top of a small tree. And then they bend the tree over and hook it up there, and when the animal comes walking through the loop, he triggers the snare, and all of a sudden the tree goes... Whack. And the animal is snared by the trap. Now that's different than the box trap that you see sometimes people use that uh, can trap the animal alive. I've told you before, when I was a kid, as an asthmatic, we couldn't have any pets, so Dad would uh, set this box trap in our yard and, and catch rabbits, and we'd keep them for a few days in the garage, and, and that was the closest thing I ever got to be having a pet. How sad is that? Well, once one Easter Sunday morning, the trap was sprung, and I looked in the yard and thought, we caught the Easter bunny. We have caught the Easter Bunny and now he's not going to be able to go out. I'm just, was, I was just a little kid. <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a different kind of a trap. This is a snare trap. And normally snare traps were used to catch animals, weren't they? But look, in your next reference in Jeremiah 5.26, it says, God says, Among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait. That's the Bible word for an ambush. As he that setteth snares, they set a trap so that they can catch what? Animals? No, men! And the wicked men that it's talking about are men teaching false doctrine. Now I don't have to tell you that wicked men are still setting snares like that, aren't they? They're still teaching false doctrine and when a believer is snared by them, he starts teaching false doctrine. And what do we learn about profane and vain babblings like that up in verse 16? Paul said in verse 16, Shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Teaching false doctrine is ungodly, and it will lead to ungodly living. Pretty soon you're opposing yourself by living in sin. And listen, once the devil snares you, he does not let you go. He keeps you, according to verse 26, captive until you repent. Now listen, people get scared and nervous about that verse, but Satan taking you captive has nothing to do with you losing your salvation. That word captive should make you think of how the Jews spent 70 years in what? Captivity in Babylon. Now, while they were there in captivity in Babylon, they didn't cease to be Jews. They were still God's people. They just couldn't function as God's people. They couldn't sacrifice because God had said the only place you can sacrifice is in Jerusalem. They couldn't observe their feasts because every one of them feasts you had to offer an animal sacrifice. And they couldn't do that in Babylon. They couldn't observe the Sabbath because, <laughs> well, listen folks, they were slaves. Slaves don't get to say to the boss, you know, it's the Sabbath, I think I'll take the day off. No! So they were still the people of God. They just couldn't function as the people of God when they were in captivity. And that's what it means to be taken captive by the devil. You're still the people of God if you're taken captive by the devil. You just can't function as the people of God. Because you're not what verse 21 calls meat for the master's use. You see that in verse 21 in your Bible? If you purge yourself from these, you'll be a vessel to honor, sanctified, and meat for the master's use. You can't be meat for the master's use if Satan's got you captive because you're opposing yourself by living in sin or teaching false doctrine. Now, 
when it says that you're taken captive by Satan at his will. Don't get the wrong idea from that. People think that that means that there you are minding your own business when suddenly Satan sneaks up behind you and takes him takes you captive and suddenly you're living in sin and teaching false do doctrine. I can't even get it out with a straight face. That's not what it means when it says you're taken captive by him at Satan's will. Let me ask you about your next reference. Is that what it means in John 13:2 when it says and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Does that mean Satan snuck up on Judas when he wasn't looking and made him betray the Lord against his will? <laughs> well, you know better than that. Judas was a sinner from the beginning. Isn't that what your next reference says? John 6, 70. Jesus answered, Haven't I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. His weakness, his Achilles heel, is described in your next reference, John 12, 6. He was a thief. And he had the bag, the treasury bag for the twelve apostles. And he carried what was put therein. He was covetous. And as the treasure, he was stealing from the bag. Skimming off the top. And listen, Satan knew that weakness. And Satan capitalized on that weakness in Matthew 26, 14-16. Judas went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me and I will deliver him to you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. Listen, Satan had it, all Satan had to do was just have his minions dangle the carrot of cash. And Judas grabbed it. I've told you many times, a tree always falls in the direction that it's leaning. If you're leaning toward covetousness, that's going to be your downfall. We see more about greed in covetousness in Acts 5.3. Remember when Peter said to Ananias, watch this now, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? They were supposed to sell their land, give all the price of the land to the apostles. But that verse is another one that looks like Satan tiptoed up behind Ananias and filled his heart with making him lie to the Holy Ghost. But I want you to notice carefully that when Peter asked him something, he didn't say, How has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? He knew how it happened. It happened because Ananias let it happen. He asked him instead, Why has Satan filled your heart? In other words, why did you let it happen? Because folks, that's how Satan takes men captive. We let it happen. Yes, it's at Satan's will. It isn't God's will for you to be taken captive. It's Satan's will. But he only succeeds if you let him. So, if you're here today and you're not being the holy saint of God that God created you to be, or if you're watching or listening to this recording and you're refusing to acknowledge the truth that's after godliness, refusing to admit that Paul's gospel is the gospel for this dispensation, you're opposing yourself. And you, But listen, Paul says, you don't have to stay that way. You can recover yourself from Satan's snare. But you have to do it. God's not going to do it for you.
Isn't that what it says? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Now what you're seeing there is a dispensational difference. Paul is finishing up a thought he started in your Bible up in verse uh, 20. Look at verse 20 in your Bible. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor, some to the honor of being used of the master, some to the dishonor of being unfit for the master's use. Do you remember what we said about that verse? We said that the great house is the church which is the body of Christ, right? And we also said the only other great house in the Bible was Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple had vessels of gold and of silver that were used to the Lord, used to serve the Lord, didn't didn't it? That's what you should want to be. A vessel unto the high honor of being fit for the master's use. But speaking of those vessels in Solomon's temple, if you know your Bible, you know what happened when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Israel. Look at your next reference. 2 Chronicles 36.7 Nebuchadnezzar carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. He took the vessels of God's house, the vessels of gold and silver, out of God's house and put them in Satan's house. In other words, he took those vessels captive at his will, along with the people of Israel. Now, just like us, it was their fault. They let it happen because of their sin and rebellion against God. But, unlike us, those poor vessels couldn't recover themselves. You see, it wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar's will that those vessels be taken captive. It was God's will that they be taken captive. Look at Jeremiah 25.9. God speaking says, Behold, I will send all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Israel's been bad. They need to be chastened. I'm going to use this king to serve me. And I'll bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof. And this whole land of Israel is going to be a desolation for 70 years. It was God's will that those vessels stay there for 70 years. And the Jews stay there for 70 years. They couldn't recover themselves. They couldn't recover God's vessels. You see, they had that contract with God, that covenant that said, if they're good, I'll bless you. If you're bad, I'll curse you. They broke it. So it was God's will for them to be taken captive. Not just Satan's will, but not you. You're not under the covenant of the law of Moses. You know what that means? That means it is never God's will that you be taken captive. You, you can't break a covenant that you're not under. It is ne- it's Satan's will. You're taken captive at his will, but not God's will. That means that when it happens, you don't have to wait 70 years. You don't have to wait 70 months or weeks or days or hours or minutes. You can recover yourself from the snare of the devil if you just let the Word of God instruct you. See, that's what this dispensation is all about. Teaching, doctrine. That's why we teach up here. When the apostles were running around on the earth, the twelve apostles, they could cast out those devils that took men captive. But listen, under grace, I can't do that for you. 
I can only teach you. Don't you want to be a vessel unto honor? Don't you want to be fit for the Master's use? Don't you want to stop opposing yourself this morning? The army talks about be all you can be. Don't you want to be all you can be for God? A member of His army. But if you're not saved, you need to listen to that verse we quoted one more time in Romans 5 and verse 8. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I know most people think that they have to repent, they have to clean up their lives in order to get God to accept them and allow them into heaven. But I don't have to tell you, Christ didn't wait till you cleaned up your life to die for your sins. He died for your sins before you were ever born. And all He asks you to be, do to be saved is believe He died for your sins and rose again. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity, the high honor of being vessels unto honor of being people that can be fit for the Master's use. There's probably not a person here who hasn't had a time in their life when they haven't been the clean vessel that God wants, that you want them to be. And there's always times when we fall into teaching things that are not according to the truth, according to godliness. Father, when we fall into those times of opposing ourselves, may we be open to the instruction of God's people so that we might acknowledge our need to repent and be all that we can be for Thee. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.